Cancers of the Female Reproductive Tract. Let's begin by looking at some statistics. Cancer is the second leading cause of death for women in the United States, surpassed only by cardiovascular disease. Women have a one in three lifetime risk of developing cancer, and one out of every four deaths is from cancer. The American Cancer Society, ACS, estimated that in 2011, over 171,000 cancer deaths were caused by tobacco use. Scientific evidence suggests that about one third of the more than half a million cancer deaths were related to obesity, physical inactivity, and poor nutrition, and thus could have been prevented. Certain cancers are related to infectious agents, such as hepatitis B, human papillomavirus, HPV, and human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, as well as Helicobacter pylori, H. pylori. These can be prevented through behavioral changes, vaccines, or antibiotics. In addition, many of the more than 2 million skin cancers that are diagnosed annually could be prevented by protecting the skin from the sun's rays and avoiding indoor tanning. What to do after a diagnosis? When a woman is first diagnosed with a reproductive tract cancer, two primary needs arise information, and emotional support. When the diagnosis is made, a woman typically has many questions, such as, what is gonna to happen to me? How will this change my life? And will I survive? Two very reliable sources of general cancer information are the National Cancer Institute and the American Cancer Society. Many research studies have found that social support from family, friends, and coworkers is one of the strongest predictors of how she will cope. Cancer clients have a strong need for hope. Strategies for inspiring hope may include active listening, touch, overcome communication barriers. Often, it is not what a support person says or does, but just by their presence that counts. Assessment of a woman with cancer of the reproductive tract involves a thorough examination and personal and familial history. In addition, various laboratory and diagnostic tests may be done to evaluate for malignancy. Current and past factors may increase the risk of certain cancers, including early start to menstruation, late menopause, sexually transmitted infections, use of hormonal agents, infertility issues, and a familial history of cancer. Multiple laboratory and diagnostic tests have been employed to assist with early detection of cancer. One such test is a clinical breast examination. A clinical breast examination includes the assessment of the breast for abnormal findings. Such a test identifies palpable masses, skin changes, inverted nipples, or unresolved rashes. Another test is mammography. Mammography detects calcifications, densities, and non-palpable cancer lesions. Pap smears are another common laboratory and diagnostic test and it is used to detect cervical cancers. Pap smears aid in the detection of abnormal cells of the cervix. Another test that can be used is a transvaginal ultrasound. Transvaginal ultrasounds allow for measurement of endometrial thickness to determine if an endometrial biopsy is needed for postmenopausal bleeding that can occur. Transvaginal ultrasound is a screening used for pelvic pathology to assist in diagnosing endometrial cancers. Another test is the test for CA-125. CA-125 is a nonspecific blood test as a tumor marker. Elevation in this tumor marker suggests malignancy but might not be specific to ovarian cancer. How do healthcare professionals recommend a diagnosis of cancer is handled by a patient? First, it's important to express feelings and concerns to reduce anxiety. It's important to assess the meaning of the diagnosis, clarify misconceptions, and to get reliable, realistic information. Gaining information about what to expect helps to decrease the uncertainty about the unknown. Use and gain new coping mechanisms. Become aware of early signs of anxiety, such as a fast heartbeat, sweating, or a flushed feeling. 
you can educate yourself to help prevent cancer by keeping consistent and timely screenings to identify cancers early. See your doctor if certain signs and symptoms appear, including blood in a bowel movement, unusual vaginal discharge or chronic vulvar itching, persistent abdominal bloating or constipation, irregular vaginal bleeding, persistent low backache not related to standing, elevated or discolored vulvar lesions, bleeding after menopause, or pain or bleeding after sexual intercourse. There are things that you can do to reduce your risk of getting cancer. Don't smoke. Drink alcohol only in moderation, no more than one drink daily. Be physically active every day. Eat a healthy diet. Stay current with immunizations. Use a condom with every sexual encounter. Reach and maintain a healthy weight. Take preventative medicines if needed. Get recommended screening tests. Check your body mass index or BMI to identify obesity. Get a mammogram every one to two years starting at the age of 40. Get a pap smear every one to three years if sexually active between the ages of 21 and 65. Get your cholesterol checked annually starting at the age of 45. Have your blood pressure checked at least every two years. If you have high blood pressure or high cholesterol, get tested for diabetes and check for STIs or sexually transmitted infections if sexually active. What about cancers of the reproductive tract in pregnant women? Pregnancy complicated by cancer is relatively rare, but because women in Western societies are tending to delay childbearing to the third and fourth decade of life, the phenomenon is getting more and more common. The most frequent malignancies diagnosed during pregnancy are breast cancer, cervical cancer, hematologic malignancies like lymphomas and acute leukemias, and melanoma or skin cancer. Less common tumors are gastrointestinal, urological, and lung cancers. Theoretically, changes in the mother's immune system during pregnancy can increase the risk of malignancy because cell-mediated immunity, which is suppressed in pregnant women, normally protects against such cancerous tumors. Ovarian cancer during pregnancy is rare because the disease typically occurs in older women. Because most pregnant women receive frequent medical care, including pelvic examinations, most ovarian cancers in pregnant women are found at early stages. This means a good prognosis for both the mother and the newborn. Endometrial cancer is the most common neoplasia of the female reproductive system with the highest incidence among uterine malignancies. It is also rarely associated with pregnancy. Since routine screening for endometrial cancer is currently not recommended in the general population, few cases would be detected in the relatively young pregnant population. Cervical cancer is more common in the pregnant population than other reproductive malignancies and it can affect the woman's health status and the pregnancy. Management of cervical cancer during pregnancy depends on five factors. First, the stage of the disease and the size of the tumor. Second, nodal status. Third, histological subtype of the tumor. Fourth, the term of the pregnancy. And fifth, whether the client wishes to continue the pregnancy. In women with early stage disease and absence of nodal involvement who are diagnosed during the first two trimesters of pregnancy, there is an increasing tendency to preserve the pregnancy while awaiting for fetal maturity. Once the fetus has matured, the birth should be performed using the cesarean section. Treatment decisions may be influenced by the stage of the cancer, the histological type, and the stage of the pregnancy. Both maternal and fetal safety and well-being have to be taken into account. Termination of pregnancy is not indicated in all cases. For young clients with cervical cancer, it may be important to be aware of surgical fertility preservation options. There may also be options for future assisted reproductive technologies. 
Women diagnosed with any malignancy during pregnancy must confront the reality of the disease and its impact on their future fertility and live with the risk of possible reoccurrence. The wishes of the pregnant woman and her family are of paramount importance when making decisions about continuing with the pregnancy and undergoing cancer treatment. Some women will decide to terminate the pregnancy for the sake of their own health. Others will undergo treatment during the pregnancy to preserve the life of the unborn child. Regardless of the woman's decision, providing support, hope, and education during treatment, birth, and beyond is of the utmost importance. Ovarian Cancer Ovarian cancer is a malignant neoplastic growth of the ovary. It is the ninth most common cancer among women and the fifth most common cause of cancer deaths for women in the United States. A woman's risk of getting invasive ovarian cancer in her lifetime is about 1 in 71. Her lifetime chance of dying from invasive ovarian cancer is about 1 in 95. Ovarian cancer mainly develops in older women. About half of the women who are diagnosed with ovarian cancer are 60 years of age or older. The most important variable influencing the prognosis of ovarian cancer is the extent of the disease. Survival depends on the stage of the tumor, the grade of differentiation, gross findings at surgery, amount of residual tumor after surgery, and the effectiveness of any adjunct treatment postoperatively. Many women with ovarian cancer will experience recurrence despite best efforts to eradicate the cancer through surgery, radiation, or chemotherapy to eliminate residual tumor cells. The five-year survival rates for of stage one ovarian cancer has an 80 to 94% chance of surviving for the next five years. Second stage reduces this to between 57% and 76%. Stage three reduces this further from 34% to 45%. Women with stage four ovarian cancer have only an 18% chance of survival for the next five years. Ovarian cancer can originate from different cell types. Most ovarian cancers originate in the ovarian epithelium. They usually present as solid masses that have spread beyond the ovary and seeded into the peritoneum prior to diagnosis. An inherited genetic mutation is the causative factor in 13 to 15% of cases of epithelial ovarian cancer. 75% of ovarian cancers are not diagnosed until the cancer has advanced to stage three or four, primarily because there is still no adequate screening test. Two genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, are linked with hereditary breast and ovarian cancers. Blood tests can be performed to assess DNA in white blood cells to detect mutations in these BRCA genes. These genetic markers do not predict whether the person will develop cancer, rather, they provide information regarding the risk of developing cancer. A woman who is BRCA positive may have up to an 80% chance of developing cancer and a 40% chance of developing ovarian cancer. To assist in screening, researchers have developed an ovarian cancer symptom index that includes pelvic and abdominal pain, urinary frequency and urgency, increased abdominal size or bloating, and difficulty eating or feeling full. Specific clinical guidelines for ovarian cancer screening have not yet been developed, so the disease is often not diagnosed until it has metastasized. CA125 is a biological tumor marker associated with ovarian cancer. Although levels are elevated in many women with ovarian cancer, CA125 is not specific for this cancer, and levels may be elevated with other malignancies such as pancreatic, liver, colon, breast, and lung cancers. Despite the discovery that CA125 and other serum markers increase before the clinical onset of ovarian cancer, it has been proven surprisingly difficult to devise a successful screening program for asymptomatic women with ovarian cancer. Treatment options for ovarian cancer vary depending on the stage and the severity of the disease. Usually, 
A laparoscopy, which is an abdominal exploration with an endoscope, is performed for diagnosis and staging, as well as for the evaluation for therapy. In stage 1, the cancer is limited to the ovaries. In stage 2, the growth involves one or both ovaries with an extension into the pelvis. In stage 3, the cancer has spread to the lymph nodes and other organs or structures inside the abdominal cavity. In stage 4, the cancer has metastasized to even more distant sites. Surgical intervention remains the mainstay of management for ovarian cancer. Surgery generally includes a total abdominal hysterectomy. Because most women are diagnosed with advanced stage ovarian cancer, aggressive management involving debulking or cytoreductive surgery is commonly performed. This surgery involves resecting all visible tumors from the peritoneum and taking peritoneal biopsies, sampling lymph nodes, and removing all reproductive organs. This aggressive surgery has been shown to improve long-term survival rates. Let's review some of the risk factors associated with ovarian cancer. Nulliparity, or never having given birth. Early menarche. Late menopause after 55 years of age increasing age of over 50 years, a high-fat diet, obesity, persistent ovulation over time, first-degree relative with ovarian cancer, use of perennial talcum powders or hygiene sprays, being older than 30 years of age for first pregnancy, positive BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations, a personal history of breast, bladder, or colon cancer, and infertility, Endometrial cancer. Endometrial cancer, also known as uterine cancer, is a malignant neoplastic growth of the uterine lining. It is the fourth most common gynecological malignancy and accounts for 6% of all cancers in women in the United States. It is uncommon for endometrial cancer to occur before the age of 40, but as women age, their risk of endometrial cancer increases. Approximately 95% of these malignancies are carcinomas of the endometrium. Because endometrial cancer is usually diagnosed in the early stages, it has a better prognosis than cervical or ovarian cancers. Two mechanisms are believed to be involved in the development of endometrial cancer. First, a history of exposure to unopposed estrogen which is the cause of 75% of endometrial cancers in women. The second mechanism seems to be spontaneous and are unrelated to estrogen or endometrial hyperplasia. These spontaneous developments represent 25% of endometrial cancers. Endometrial cancer may originate in a polyp or in a diffuse multifocal pattern. The pattern of spread partially depends on the degree of cellular differentiation well-differentiated tumors tend to limit their spread to the surface of the endometrium. Metastatic spread occurs in a characteristic pattern and most commonly involves the lungs, liver, bones, brain, and vagina. Early tumor growth is characterized by friable and spontaneous bleeding. Later tumor growth is characterized by myometrial invasion and growth towards the cervix. Adenocarcinoma of the endometrium is typically preceded by hyperplasia or an overgrowth. Carcinoma in situ is found only on the endometrial surface. Type 1 carcinomas are the most common. These are benign, as endometrial replacement therapy leads to an increased risk for endometrial cancer. Type 1 carcinomas are generally found at an earlier stage and treatment results are more favorable. Unlike type 1 endometrial carcinoma, type 2 carcinomas appear spontaneously and are associated with poorly differentiated cell types and have a poor prognosis. Type 2 carcinomas account for less than 10% of all endometrial cancers but contribute to the majority of all endometrial deaths. Screening for endometrial cancer is not routinely done because it is not practical or cost-effective. The American Cancer Society recommends that women be informed about the risks and symptoms of endometrial cancer and strongly encourage 
women to report any unexpected bleeding or spotting to their healthcare provider. A pelvic examination is frequently normal in the early stages of the disease. Changes in the size, shape, or consistency of the uterus or its surrounding supportive structures may exist when the disease becomes more advanced. Transvaginal ultrasound can be used to evaluate the endometrial cavity and to measure the thickness of the endometrial lining. It can be used to detect endometrial hyperplasia or overgrowth. If the endometrium measures less than 4 millimeters, then the client is at low risk for malignancy. Staging is the process of looking at all of the information the doctors have learned about the tumor to determine how much the cancer has spread. The stage of an endometrial cancer is the most important factor in choosing a treatment plan. It can spread locally to other parts of the uterus or regionally to nearby lymph nodes. The regional lymph nodes are found in the pelvis and further away along the aorta. Finally, the cancer can spread or metastasize to distant lymph nodes or organs, including the lung, liver, bone, brain, and others. In stage 1 endometrial cancer, the tumor has spread to the muscular wall of the uterus. In stage 2, it has spread to the cervix but not outside of the cervix. In stage 3, it has spread regionally to the bowel or vagina with metastasis to pelvic lymph nodes. In stage 4, endometrial cancer has invaded the bladder mucosa with distant metastases to the lungs, liver, and bone. Typically, the stage of the disease directs the treatment. It usually involves surgery with adjunct therapy based on pathological findings. Surgery most often involves removal of the uterus via hysterectomy and the fallopian tubes and ovaries via a procedure called salpingo ophorectomy. Removal of the fallopian tubes and ovaries is recommended because tumor cells spread early to the ovaries and any dormant cancer cells could be stimulated to grow again by ovarian estrogen. In more advanced cancers, radiation and chemotherapy are used as adjuncts to surgery. Routine surveillance intervals for follow-up care are typically every three to four months for the first two years, since 85% of reoccurrences occur in the first three years after diagnosis. Let's look at the risk factors for endometrial cancer. Nulliparity, or not having been pregnant. Obesity with more than 50 pounds overweight liver disease, infertility, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, history of pelvic radiation, polycystic ovarian syndrome, early menarche before 12 years of age, high fat diet, use of prolonged exogenous unopposed estrogen with an intact uterus, endometrial hyperplasia, familial history of endometrial cancers, personal history of hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer, personal history of breast, colon, or ovarian cancer, history of uterine fibroids, late onset of menopause after the age of 52, use of a drug called tamoxifen, and chronic anovulation. Occasionally, endometrial cancers can cause signs and symptoms, including painful urination, low back pain, genital discharge, pelvic pain, unexplained weight loss, and a change in bladder or bowel habits. Cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is cancer of the uterine cervix. Some researchers estimate that non-invasive cervical cancer, carcinoma in situ, is about four times more common than invasive cervical cancer. The five-year survival rate for all stages of cervical cancer is 72%. Cervical cancer is five to eight times more common in women affected with HIV or AIDS than those who do not have the virus. Cervical cancer tends to occur in midlife. Most cases are found in women younger than the age of 50. It rarely develops in women younger than 20 years of age. Almost 20% of women with cervical cancer are diagnosed when they are 65 years or older. The probability of a woman in the United States developing cervical cancer is approximately 1 in 120, but the statistic is age-dependent. The highest incidence is seen in women between 40 and 49 years of age. 
The incidence and mortality rates of cervical cancer has decreased noticeably in the past several decades, with most of the reduction attributed to pap tests or pap smears, which detect cervical cancer and precancerous lesions. The pap test or pap smear is a procedure used to obtain cells from the cervix for cytological screening. Cervical cancer is one of the most treatable cancers when detected at an early age. Cervical cancer starts with abnormal changes in the cellular lining of the surface of the cervix. The continuous replacement of columnar epithelial cells by squamous epithelial cells in this area makes these cells vulnerable to take up foreign or abnormal genetic material. Cervical cancer is the second leading cause of cancer deaths among women worldwide. It has been linked to the human papillomavirus, or HPV, which is acquired through sexual activity. HPV is the most common type of sexually transmitted infection, with at least 50% of sexually active men and women becoming infected at some point in their lifetime. Most people who have HPV are asymptomatic and therefore do not realize that they have the virus. More than 90% of squamous cervical cancers contain HPV DNA, and the virus is now accepted as the major causative factor in the development of cervical cancer and its precursor, cervical dysplasia, which is disordered growth of abnormal cells. Screening for cervical cancer is very effective because the presence of, the, of a precursor lesion, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, or CIN, helps determine whether further tests are needed. Lesions start as dysplasia and progress in a predictable fashion over a long period of time, allowing ample opportunity for intervention and at a precancerous stage. Progression from low-grade to high-grade dysplasia takes an average of nine years, and progression from high-grade dysplasia to, can to invasive cancer takes up to two years. Three main factors have been postulated to influence the progression of low-grade dysplasia to high-grade. These include the type and duration of viral infection with high-risk HPV type and persistent infection predicting a higher risk for progression. Host conditions that compromise immunity, such as multiparity or poor nutritional status, and environmental factors such as smoking, oral contraceptive use, or vitamin deficiencies. In addition, various gynecological factors, including age of menarche, age of first intercourse, and number of sexual partners significantly increases the risk for cervical cancers. Although professional medical organizations disagree as to the recommended frequency of screening for cervical cancer, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists recommends that cervical cancer screening should begin at the age of 21 years regardless of sexual history. Younger than age 21 are at a very low risk of cancer. In addition, it is advised that pap smears be given every two years for women between the ages of 21 and 29, and every three years for women ages 30 and older who have had three consecutive negative cervical cytological screenings and have no high-risk pap smear history. In addition, women must have a clear understanding of the results of pap smear testing and follow-up guidelines. High-risk women should continue to have annual pap smears throughout their lifetime. Treatment for abnormal pap smears depends on the severity of the results and the health history of the woman. Therapeutic choices all involve destroying as many affected cells as possible. One such treatment is cryotherapy. Cryotherapy destroys abnormal cervical tissue by freezing it with liquid nitrogen, freon, or nitrous oxide. Studies show Cryotherapy results in a 90% cure rate. Healing from cryotherapy takes up to about six weeks, and the client may experience a profuse, watery vaginal discharge for three to four weeks. Another treatment for abnormal pap smears are cone biopsies or conization. Cone biopsies removes a cone-shaped section of cervical tissue. The base of the cone is formed by the ectocervix, which is the outer part of the cervix, and the point or apex of the cone is formed from the endocervical canal. The transformation zone is contained within this cone sample. The cone biopsy is also a treatment and can be used to completely remove any precancers and very early cancers. 
Other treatments for abnormal pap smears includes laser therapy. Laser therapy destroys diseased cervical tissue by using a focused beam of high energy light to vaporize it, thereby burning it off. After the procedure, the woman may experience a watery brown discharge for a few weeks. Laser therapy is very effective in destroying precancers and preventing them from developing into cancers. Another treatment for abnormal results in a pap smear include hysterectomy, which removes the uterus and the cervix. Radiation therapy can also be used to treat abnormal pap smears. Radiation therapy is delivered by an internal radium applications to the cervix or external radiation therapy that includes lymphatic of the pelvis. Another approach is chemoradiation. Chemoradiation is weekly cisplatin therapy concurrent with radiation. There are strategies that a patient can employ to optimize pap smear results. Schedule the pap smear appointment about 2 week 10 to 18 days after the first day of your last menses. This increases the chances of getting the best sample of the cervix. Refrain from intercourse for about 48 hours before the test because additional matter such as sperm can obscure the specimen. Do not douche within 48 hours before the test to prevent washing away cervical cells that might be abnormal. Do not use tampons, birth control foams, jellies, vaginal creams, or vaginal medications for 72 hours before the test because they could cover up or obscure the cervical cell sample. Cancel your pap appointment if vaginal bleeding occurs because the presence of blood cells interferes visually with the evaluation of the cellular sampling. Vaginal cancer Vaginal cancer is malignant tissue growth arising in the vagina. Vaginal cancer is rare. Only about one of every 100 cancers of the female reproductive system is a vaginal cancer. In 2011, the most recent year for which data is available for vaginal cancer in the United States, the American Cancer Society estimated that more than 2,500 new cases were diagnosed in women. The peak of incidence of vaginal cancer occurs at 60 to 65 years of age. The prognosis of vaginal cancer depends largely on the stage of the disease and the type of the tumor. The overall 5-year survival rate for squamous cell carcinoma is about 42%. The 5-year survival rate for adenocarcinoma is about 78%. Vaginal cancer can be effectively treated and when found early is often curable. Malignant diseases of the vagina are either primary vaginal cancers or metastatic forms of adjacent or distant organs. About 80% of vaginal cancers are metastatic, primarily from the cervix and endometrium. These cancers invade the vagina directly. Cancers from distant sites that metastasize to the vagina through the blood or lymphatic system are typically from the colon, kidneys, skin, or breasts. Tumors in the vagina commonly occur on the posterior wall and spread to the cervix or vulva. Squamous cell carcinomas that begin in the epithelial lining of the vagina account for about 85% of vaginal cancers. This type of cancer usually occurs in women over the age of 50. Squamous cell carcinomas develop slowly over a period of years, commonly in the upper third portion of the vagina. They tend to spread early by directly invading the bladder and rectal walls. They also metastasize through the blood and lymphatics. The remaining 15% are adenocarcinomas, which differ from squamous cell carcinomas by an increase in pulmonary metastases and supraclavicular and pelvic nodal involvement. Treatment of vaginal cancers depends on the type of cells involved and the stage of the disease. If the cancer is localized, radiation, laser surgery, or both can be used. If the cancer has spread, radical surgery might be needed, such as hysterectomy or removal of the upper vagina with dissection of the pelvic nodes, in addition to radiation therapy. Vulvar cancer. Vulvar cancer is the abnormal neoplastic growth of the external female genitalia. Vulvar cancer accounts for approximately 5% of all female genital malignancies. It occurs in about 1.5 per 100,000 women in developed countries. It is the fourth most common gynecological cancer after endometrial, ovarian, and cervical cancers. 
When detected early, vulvar cancer is highly curable. Vulvar cancer is most commonly found in older women in their mid-60s to mid-70s, but the incidence in women younger than 35 years old has been increasing during the past few decades. The overall 5-year survival rate when lymph nodes are not involved is 90%, but it drops to between 50-70% to when the lymph nodes have been invaded. Approximately 90% of vulvar tumors are squamous cell carcinomas. This type of cancer forms slowly over several years and is usually preceded by precancerous changes. These precancerous changes are termed vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia. The two major types of vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia, or VIN, are classic, undifferentiated, and simplex, differentiated. Classic VIN is the more common one and is associated with HPV infection and smoking. It typically occurs in women between 30 and 40 years of age. In contrast to classic VIN, simplex VIN usually occurs in postmenopausal women and is not associated with HPV. Annual vulvar examination is the most effective way to prevent vulvar cancer. Careful inspection of the vulva during routine annual gynecological examinations remains the most productive diagnostic technique. Liberal use of biopsies of any suspicious vulvar lesions is usually necessary to make the diagnosis and to guide treatment. Treatment of vulvar cancers depends on the extent of the disease. Laser surgery, cryosurgery, or electrosurgical incisions may be made. Larger lesions may need more extensive surgery and skin grafting. The traditional treatment for vulvar cancers has been radical vulvectomy, but more conservative techniques are now being used to improve psychosexual outcomes. In most cases, the woman reports persistent vulvar itching, burning, and edema that do not improve with the use of creams or ointments. A history of condyloma, gonorrhea, and herpes simplex are some of the factors that increase the risk for VIN. Diagnosis of vulvar carcinoma is often delayed. Women neglect to seek treatment for an average of six months from the onset of symptoms. In addition, a delay in diagnosis often occurs after the client presents to her physician. Living a healthy lifestyle, checking new symptoms with your doctor, and complying with recommended screening procedures is the best way to minimize your risk of getting cancer. Thank you for watching.